Hello, and thank you for choosing to watch this video. This is number nine in the series of What If Fantasy Model Kit Box Artwork. Anyone who grew up in the 1970s and went to the cinema will have seen at least one of the uh, Doug McClure science fiction adventure films. Very enjoyable, low budget films with their heart in the right place. There were four films all starring Doug McClure and all directed by Kevin Connor. And he really must get a lot of credit for you know, creating these very sincere, very fun adventure films. The Land That Time Forgot is the first of the films, set around the time of the First World War, and the action largely involves a uh, German U-boat, which is commandeered by Doug McClure and some of the other survivors from a shipwreck. Uh, they end up discovering this island of Caprona, which is in the middle of the Antarctic, and the island is filled with tropical areas and dinosaurs. <laughs> Uh, this picture shows the U-boat uh, sort of entering through the underwater cave where they go from Antarctica into the, the, the lush world of Caprona. It's shorter in this painting than it is in the movie. It's quite a sequence in the movie, but I wanted to kind of show like the icebergs behind them and then hint at the sort of warm, lush vegetation that they're heading towards. The U-boat itself, I don't know that it's a specific type of U-boat. It looks very much like a type U-31, but it looks to be smaller because I think they built a lot of this full size for the actors. And it's got some other modifications like the ballast tanks along the sides have a flat top, I guess, so they could stage the action they needed to do um, rather than the more curved ones. I could be wrong. It could be one that looks just like this, but I think there's been a bit of artistic license to give the filmmakers what they needed. And it's really convincing. I mean, the, the, the interior of it looks great. Exteriors, the model shots are really nice. I think this would just be a, a fun kit. I think, in, you know, 144 scale, it'd be about 14 inches long, which is a pretty decent size. The U-Boat from the land that time forgot. This film was followed by At the Earth's Core, which was another Edgar Rice Burroughs adventure. And I actually covered this in video number one, uh, where I um, talked about the Iron Mole that features in that film. So, so go check that out. Following that was The People That Time Forgot, which was a sequel to The Land That Time Forgot. And in this one, Patrick Wayne has sort of gone searching for Double Claw's character. And they travel via ship, and then they get to the island using an amphibious biplane, which is a Vickers Viking flying bow. Um, I don't know if they did anything to this. This looks pretty much like an actual one. I don't know if they built a prop for the movie or if this is a real one. This would be just a, a nice 172nd scale model of this plane. I think there's some limited run models out there, but again, following the theme of these, these videos, it'd be great if there'd been a kit of this at the time with the sort of the film logo on the box. A lot of the characters make their escape from the island and they're all kind of like jammed into the various little um, cockpit areas on this thing. So it'd be great if you got all those figures. And then following this was the Warlords of Atlantis, which was the only one not based on an Edgar Rice Burroughs novel. It's an original story, but again, it's Kevin Connor, it's Doug McClure, it's a bunch of monsters. And this one involves uh, the Aitken expedition, which is this father and son, doctors, professors. You've enlisted Doug McClure, who's, who's the engineer, the designer of this cool looking diving bell that's carried on the ship the Texas Rose so they can kind of go exploring underwater and no surprise from the title they end up in Atlantis um, it's a really nicely designed thing I think Elliot Scott was the production designer on this movie and he did you know great great sets for Oppression Crossbow and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and you know so I think he was the person behind this design if not I'd love to know if anyone knows please let me know the Texas Rose is looks to be a, a modern ship that's been kind of converted and retrofitted for the look in the film it's kind of like some the big cabin actually has big sort of windows in it that they've sort of painted over and put portholes on it and it's a sailing ship with the Aiken underwater observatory sort of on the front which they winch and lower down and and the captain of the ship is actually Actually, uh, Shane Rimmer, Scott Tracy himself. So again, this would be a good one to get the respective characters. I think there's only eight characters on, on the ship. So if you got the captain and Doug McClure and the, and the crewman, that would be fantastic. I think this would this would have been one of those kits. I think I put it here in 72nd scale. Um, it's not huge. And it's like the other ships of the time, the, the Airfix were doing certainly, which had vac form sail, which is kind of cream, canvasy colour, and had sort of black threads sort of stitched together for various bits of rigging. So if it got all that, it'd be a nice model. It'd be celebrating the Doug McClure films and, 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 you know, when you were a little kid, you could get it and play with it in the bath and, and reenact all the, all the action. Another film from the 70s set on the water, Jaws. <laughs> Probably a film that needs no real introduction, but the orca in that I was always struck with how cool it looks, and it definitely looks the part, and it just really photographs well. I mean, part of that is, you know, the director. 
<laughs> around the cameraman. Everything got really great angles on it. But this is also not a real boat. I mean, it's a real boat, but you can't, you couldn't buy something that looked like this. It's a, I think it's like a lobster fishing boat that the um, art department, Joe elves the production designer they got this boat and they kind of built up the cabin area they put the sort of pulpit on top where where hooper drives the boat and the and a lot of the other stuff the little um gangway out the front and and lots of things that just kind of really sort of dress it up and make it look cool pretty interesting i just thought it was a real boat that they found but no it's had a quite a bit of um work done to it to make it look the part in the film and this painting just sort of shows them sort of out at sea looking for the shark waiting for all heck to break loose if there's anyone watching this who has not seen the movie Jaws, watch it. Give yourself two and a half hours. All the hype about it is absolutely true. It's a fantastic film. Do yourself a favour and see it if you haven't. And if you haven't seen it in a while, watch it again. It's just, it just never gets old. So many great scenes. Again, sticking with the water, For Your Eyes Only was a James Bond film. It was one of the Roger Moore Bond films. Came off to Moonraker and was kind of the, the, the down-to-earth Bond. And that has a really great sequence in it involving this Neptune mini-sub. Bond has to investigate this uh, lost sort of fishing trawler, which is really a spy ship for the British. I thought this was a real sub. Again, it, it looks like a lot of the sort of subs you'd see on Jacques Cousteau and those sort of things but it but it isn't it's actually it was designed for the movie I'm not sure by who probably the production designer I don't know if Derek Meddings had a hand in it because he's responsible for all the visual effects the models and the, the full-size effects but anyway something they fabricated for the film and it was actually driven by um, divers in wetsuits in the film it's all self-contained and pressurized so Bond and Molina can can talk and everything and this would be, you know, I put it at a 30 second scale. So I think it'd probably be about a foot long, a decent size. Lots of detail on it. And it's got like little searchlights on the front that are posable. Probably be in a nice white plastic. Sticking with Bond, but getting back to reality or as much reality as you kind of get in a Bond film. This is kind of a dogfight double. It's from the speedboat chase in Live and Let Die. It's a lengthy sequence. Bond is chased by Dr. Kananga's henchman. And this shows Bond in the red and white at Glastron GT150. And then the, the henchman, he really kind of gives Bond the, the hardest time in this chase. Because a Glastron CV21. Glastron apparently gave him like 20 boats. And if you've seen the movie, you'll you'll see why. It's, this, is, this sequence is absolutely incredible. There's so much great stunt work and and some of the stuff they do with these boats is, is amazing. And, and what's really cool about it is it's all really done there. Roger Moore's really driving the boat. There's no like back projection or blue screen or anything like that. It's, you can tell it's really him. And you can tell like they're traveling at huge speeds. His hair's blowing in the wind. It's, it's such a fantastic sequence. It uh, really doesn't get the recognition I think it deserves. It's one of the great movie uh, chase sequences to me. This would be a 1970s kit, hence, hence the box artwork. A Bond's boat would probably be in white plastic or maybe red. And then, and then the other boat, which is a very nice glossy black would be even sort of black plastic this would just be a really cool fun little kit uh, you know you get a lot of battleship kits and you got a lot of ocean liners you know but you don't really get like speed boats like even those world speed record you know the, those powerboat racing things i haven't seen models of those so just having a model of a speed boat would just be fun i think Sticking with boats or ships, here is a movie called San Demetrio, London. This is a British film based on a true story from World War II. In it, the crew has to abandon their damaged cargo ship and after days adrift, it's still afloat, and the film follows their efforts to get the ship home to port. This is one of those films that here in the UK might be referred to as a Sunday afternoon film, as it was quite frequently shown on BBC Two on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. The ship is depicted mostly in the film with miniatures, and the primary model built for the film is actually on display at the Imperial War Museum in London. The ship is about 450 feet long, so following Airfix's standard battleship scale of 1 600th. It'll be about nine inches long, so reasonable size. This painting shows the ship sort of battling the rough seas in the North Atlantic, which is basically the film. <laughs> The kit would be the ship intact, and I think it would be kind of um, interesting if in the instructions there was maybe a, a sort of a diagram that showed which pieces of it sort of get destroyed or damaged, and then that would be uh, up to the modeler to provide that themselves, either by not 
putting certain parts on or damaging it or whatever, but just a fun model project. But it would basically build the ship as it is at the start of the film. Another Sunday afternoon black and white film is Hell Drivers. And it's black and white. It's sort of shot in the winter time, so it's very kind of grey and very raw. And basically it's about the small company that does hauling. And all the drivers get paid by how much they haul in a day. So there's lots of action with them chasing each other down, down roads and trying to cut in front of another one just to kind of get an extra extra few quid. And these are all real lorries. It's a fictional company, obviously, but I think there's 13 lorries in the Hawlett fleet. I really wanted to sort of capture that kind of like wintry day, grey sky, two of the trucks just barreling along. You'd get two trucks in the kit. It's 76 scale, probably a bit small, maybe a 30 second would, would be better. But I kind of figured based on the film, having two smaller kits might be better than one big kit because there's so many trucks and they've all got different drivers. One of the great things about this film is the cast is a who's who of soon-to-be really famous stars of TV and film. Patrick McGowan, the, the tough guy that they all, they all want to beat, you know, he's number one. Sean Connery, uh, James Bond himself. <laughs> David McCallum, he plays the brother of Stanley Baker, who's the star of the film. William Hartnell is the head of the company. Gordon Jackson, Sid James, and Herbert Lom. He's the first person who befriends Stanley Baker's character. Jill Ireland, Alfie Bass. But it's just a really good film. It's a very British film. It's in black and white, in Vista Vision. Another sort of Sunday afternoon gem is a film called No Highway, or I believe in the States it's called No Highway in the Sky, based on a novel by Neville Shute. And it basically focuses on this plane, the Rutland Reindeer. And specifically, you know, there was a crash. One of these things crashed. And Jimmy Stewart is uh, sort of brought in to sort of investigate like why it happened. So there's a lot of action on, in and around the Rutland Reindeer. They designed and built this thing for the movie. I mean, they built a full-size one when it's on the ground and obviously interiors, which I think used some landing gear maybe, or it used some parts from a, from a Handley Page Halifax, but the rest of it's all sort of you know, built from scratch and obviously there's there's miniatures of it when it when it's flying but it's really impressive that they design this thing and it's pretty it's pretty odd looking the film is set in britain and what had been what had been learned and developed in the war was being put into civil aircraft now so it was just a real like pioneering imaginative time for aircraft and this book and this film really sort of fits right in with that it's a british plane so i've kind of got it against that kind of gray sort of stormy sky you know, a bit more threatening for the storyline I had to use my imagination a bit on what colours the markings would be. So I put red, white and blue because it's a British thing. It's clearly bare metal gleams, this thing. Uh, one for four scale would be a good size for something like this. Sticking with fictional aircraft, the Villiers Vindicator. Now this is a plane that is described in the Ian Fleming James Bond novel of Thunderball. In the film of Thunderball, they adapted it to be a, an Avro Vulcan bomber, probably to give it a bit more credibility. But in the book, it's a fictional thing. It's like another V bomber. So with the, the Valiant and the Victor and the Vulcan, there would be the Vindicator. It's a nuclear bomber. It gets hijacked by Spectre and, you know, forms the central part sort of of the story. Um, it, it's sort of interesting because in the story and in the film, a lot of the action is done with mock-ups because the thing crashes and it's underwater for a lot of it or, or with miniatures. There's a bit of real footage of a Vulcan flying, but given the amount of screen time it has and how much of it is fake anyway, it's sort of like, well, they could have built something specially. They could have built the Villiers Vindicator and Ken Adam could have designed it. And if we all just pause for a minute and imagine what Ken Adam would have done designing a, a fictional aircraft, that would have been something to see. But not the case. They used a Vulcan. So this is my take on the Villiers Vindicator. It's not really described in the book. So I kind of referenced those other three V bombers and aircraft of the time. I've done it in that classic white paint scheme that all, all those were done in with the you know the subtle markings and stuff. So yeah, I just thought this would be a fun, a fun kit from the novel Thunderball. So that about wraps it up for this one. Thank you very much for watching. As always, please visit my website. There's a sort of shop uh, aspect attached to that where you can buy prints. You can also commission artwork. Contact me through the website. Thanks very much for watching. Another video coming soon. Take care. Bye-bye.